Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for watching. Thanks for checking us out. This is the eleventh uh, episode of the live stream series, and um, really ecstatic to have my good friend, uh, Mr. Matthew Grable, uh, with us today. He's going to play some wonderful music. Uh, talk a little bit about music. How are you doing, Matt? Everything's good. I'm doing well. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy, for having me today. And it's wonderful to get together as well because it's been way too long, and we go back a long time. We we do go back yeah. a long time. <laughs> we. We were uh, we were classmates uh, at, at the Juilliard School together. How how long ago was that? I mean, that was um, long years. time ago. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess years. next year will be ten years since I graduated. Wow. I don't know about yourself. Probably. Yeah. I think, yeah. Pretty close. Seven right? years. Seven years. Yeah. 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 Time flies. Time flies. Indeed it does. Yeah, and you know we, it's it's funny with all of these things uh, that I've done so far. I always talk about, uh, you know how how we met. You know we met as students, but. Once I stop and think about it, it's like, you know, we were already kind of adults. We were sort of fully formed as artists by the time we met. So tell me a little bit about how, I mean, what, what were you doing before we met? Like, what was that journey like? How did you, how did you get into music and, and all of that stuff? Sure. Well, grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, uh, about an hour and a half from Philly. Um, nice. My family's not musical at all, so it Interesting. Was sort of serendipitous that I came to music. Um, yeah. When I was a kid, my older brother and I would have cassette tapes that we would listen to when we went on vacation or went on a road trip or something like that. And one of the tapes that we had was called Mr. Bach Comes to Paul. And it was sort of a kid's story tape about Bach's life in music. And um, Actually, my older brother was really infatuated with it, and every time it was his turn to choose, he would pick it every single time. Mm. So, so he was the one that began taking piano lessons when we got back from one trip in particular where he was really into it. Yeah. And uh, then I came up along a few years later, began studying as well. Yeah. And um, yeah, Lancaster is a rather s small town, but it has a really wonderful music community there. Um, a lot That's of support nice. for young musicians that um, grow up there and really great concerts so I was fortunate to be sort of immersed in that from a young age yeah that's that's interesting so it's so it's almost like you, you sort of heard that and you realized that it was something special you just sort of had an immediate yeah wow that's right and you were like this is I want to do this this is what I want exactly. to do wow and, and then you know I would go to my parents would take me to symphony concerts yeah um, so I think I was nine, 10, maybe 11 year, years old. Mm -hmm. And um, Andre Watts, a great American pianist, came to play with the symphony. And awesome. That was a special occasion because that was probably the first time I heard somebody of his stature. Um, yeah. First time I heard Rachmaninoff's second concerto. Wow. Um, live, but you know, the, just the whole spectacle, the way that he presented himself, the whole sort of uh, demeanor of it, and then of course, the music itself. Yeah. Just, sort of all struck me and I yeah. remember turning to my parents then and saying, hey, I want to be a pianist. So I can actually <laughs> pinpoint that specific concert was um, where I remember really just falling in love with music and the idea of becoming a, a pianist. And, you know, that's amazing. So Andre Watts playing Rachmaninoff second. That's right. It's, it's <laughs> funny because uh, I actually, when I was young, I, I heard Andre Watts, I think twice live. Uh -huh. He came through Chicago yeah. a couple of times and I remember both times I was I was just blown away. I'm, I was a little kid, but I. So probably right around the same time. It might have been actually, yeah. yeah. It might have been right around the same right. time. He's he's such a fantastic pianist. And, and uh, yeah, he had player. a little bit of a connection, personal connection to Lancaster because mm -hmm. the uh, the former music director of the symphony had been one of his mentors growing up. So he always had this sort of soft spot for the community and for for the symphony. So that's why he would come back and perform sometimes. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. And that's, and that's pretty cool that that's the piece that he played, too, because yes. that's, such a, that's such an iconic part of piano repertoire. So it's, it's pretty, pretty amazing. When, when, I, when I heard him, he wasn't playing with an orchestra. He was solo. It was, solo. It was wow. a solo recital. And um, I just remember being really small and just thinking, like, I'm not entirely sure uh, like, what, what's happening, but I know it's amazing, whatever, whatever, whatever <laughs> it is. So. That's, yeah. that's, pretty, that's pretty amazing that he, he inspired both of us when we were both so young. And so, so you've been, you just started taking piano lessons then? I did, yes, yeah. locally. And then I had several wonderful teachers in awesome. Lancaster. And then when I was around 12, I began taking lessons in Philadelphia. Yeah. 
So I would go to Philadelphia every week and have a lesson, and sometimes stay for a Philadelphia Orchestra concert or Chamber Music Society concert. So that was that was wonderful as well. Um, mm. Back at the Academy of Music before the Kimmel Center was built, um, such a vibrant sort of community to, to, to you know sort of sort of see peripherally once yeah. a week when I was there. That's wonderful. And so then at at some point you ended up. Uh, you ended up going to Juilliard, right? So that's that's how right. the two of us met. Yeah. And so, um, what what was that? What was that like? I mean, I I was sort of there for a lot of it, but we were sort of in different. We were in, we had different teachers. We had right. kind of a different experience. Yeah. So, well, how, I, how was that like making that transition? Well, it's a big. It's a far cry from where I grew up. It's very yeah. rural from where I grew up. You yeah. know, obviously a far cry from that. But I think I was. You know, first of all, I was very excited about being there. Second of all, um, you know, going to summer festivals. I already felt like I knew a lot of people, so in many ways it was like entering a community of friends. Yes. Right? And mm -hmm. um, so I think I really remember feeling quite at home from the beginning, and of course, I uh, was studying with Jerome Lowenthal, who right. is and was and still very much awesome. fantastic. Yeah, yes. awesome guy. And then a little bit later, I know we did share a teacher with Mr. Roccalio. Oh, a few that's years. right. Yeah, yeah, we did. That's right. Yeah. That's awesome. The, I, I, I totally forgot about that, but yeah, we did, we did. And so, so now uh, you've told me you're doing a lot of teaching yourself now. Right. And so, yeah. um, you know, have you carried, uh, you know, have you carried anything from any of those teachers that you had either in college or formative years? Do you, do you sort of, uh, do you sort of use some of the things that you picked up from them in your own teaching or how do you feel about that? You know, I, I think so. And I think a lot of it is conscious and, um, deliberate yeah but then there are so many sort of unspoken unconscious things that you do that are certainly as a result of uh, you know something that you've been taught whether you realize it or not yeah um, I would say a lot of um, the teacher that I had in high school from when I was around 12 until I was 18 I think I have carried with me there are certain sort of phrases or ideas about music that really shaped me yeah. in such a deep way. Yeah. You know, at that age, of course, you're, you're very impressionable, but mm -hmm. you're also eager to learn. Um, and I think one of those things was the idea of developing, and this was something that he was really adamant about, is developing a, a deep stylistic understanding for each composer, right? So the way that you play different types of music is different. You know, in piano, obviously, we, we voice things differently it's Rachmaninoff or if it's Chopin or if it's Mozart. So there's yeah. different sort of stylistic characteristics. So your sort of mindset is different with every type of music that you approach. So that's one of the things I think I remember very strongly from my lessons with him that I carry, carry with, with me and, and try to, as best I can, sort of pass on to, yeah. to students when I, when I work with them. Yeah, and so what... You know what kind of students are you working with? Is it sort of like all ages, all ranges? You know how sure. how do you how do you approach dealing with, uh, you know, sort of different goals for different students and then different entry levels for different students? Like how is how is that something that you that you approach? Well, I have some students of you know many different ages. Um, one of the areas I would say I've enjoyed really working with is adult students. You know, yeah. who are you know music lovers and mm -hmm. amateurs, um, and you know. Part of what I like about that is how much they challenge you, right? You can't just ask them to try something without having really strong intention behind it. Yeah. Right? Otherwise, they'll call you. Right? <laughs> yeah, they so want to know that, why am I doing exactly. this. Exactly. Yeah. So I find that, that you learn a lot from that yourself, too, because it really calls you to fine-tune your judgment and your thinking. So many things that you sometimes just do spontaneously or you do intuitively, yeah. you're asked to really compartmentalize them and put them in words and put them into ideas. Yeah. And that's very um, that's very interesting. Yeah. But I but I would also say, you know, especially with younger students, that's of course a different challenge. It's a very sure exciting challenge. You know, the, the prospect of um, perhaps getting someone to love music yeah. for a lifetime. That's sort of an it would say like an, an awesome task. Of, it responsibility. Is. Yeah. Um, but I think with studying an instrument, studying music, we have the opportunity to be very idealistic about how you teach. You can really teach the person. Right? Yeah. So rather than having one way of teaching someone, I think that you sort of find what brings the best out of the student, what their sort of magnetic pool is and their personality 
right? Yeah. And you can you can adapt that to whoever you're working with. Mm. So that's something that I think personally I I think is very important when you know when I'm teaching, especially a younger student. Yeah. You know, it's it's actually it's really interesting to hear you say that because I I do also teach a lot of young yeah. students, mm -hmm. but most of them actually aren't pianists. Most of them I'm, I'm teaching theory, so it's like sort of a class. It's not right. a one-on-one -on -one thing. And so they already sort of play instruments, and they're just sort of there to learn theory or history or you know right. whatever the case, harmony, whatever the case may be. So a lot of them kind of already have that sort of drive or right. passion, you know, because for them to even be in theory, like they're probably already kind of taking it seriously. But I've also, I have I had a few young piano students and that's always something i'm curious to pick other teachers brains about like people like me and you when we were young we sort of just had that immediate fire but you know for for music where it's like i hear it this is what i'm going to do but you mentioned that you sort of have the task of some sometimes helping a young student mm -hmm. find that what like how are some of the ways that you go about doing that because i'm just kind of curious yeah no that's know, a good question to, yeah how um, do you do that yeah i would say I, I like to give my students listening assignments whenever I can. So yeah. if they're playing, let's say they're playing some, you know, piece by Mozart or whoever it is. Yeah. You know, I'll try to, to supplement that with some, you know, additional, like give them a scene from an opera to listen to or give them a symphony or a concerto to listen to. So they sort of see, I guess in a way, the light at the end of the tunnel with what this music can be and right yeah. sort of the tradition that it comes from. Um, you know, learning a little bit about the time and place that it came from as well. You know, I think that's all interesting and helpful for a student to, you know, hopefully connect with the music a little bit more deeply. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Yeah. You know, just uh, because now that I'm thinking about it, that's, I mean, that's kind of in a way what inspired me to, mm -hmm. you know, just, you know, hearing someone like right. Andre Watts or hearing these great pianists. It's like you can sort of hear like, wow this is where it can go. You know, now that I think yeah. about it, I think that recording for me uh, was probably when I, um, when I heard Horowitz play uh, Scriabin uh, D sharp minor A2. Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. and you know, something about that recording, yeah. like seeing that, I was like, right. oh, so this is, <laughs> this is real, <laughs> this is real piano playing. I'm not sure what I've been doing up until now. Right. But this is, this is where it can really go. Yeah, you know? and I think kind of connecting to those two points, as somebody is, already engaged, yeah. then maybe the priority is a little bit different. Then it can be very interesting to sort of have them learn about the, you know, the traditions of performance, right? How two different people can come to totally different conclusions, but equally, you know, truthful conclusions about the music. Yeah. Right? So I always like to, you know, you said famous example, but give the example of the Goldberg variations with Glenn Gould's earlier and later recording, right? I've done sure. this before where I've given it to, to, uh, to a student mm -hmm. without saying what it is or who it is. I just say, listen to both of these and yeah. tell me, does it not amaze you how somebody could come to totally different conclusions about the same music? Yeah. And yet, then they find out it's actually the same person. The same. There's 27 years in between. This yeah. is how the mind has been shaped or how the ears have changed, Yeah. right, to adapt to the music. Um, yeah, that's, that's, and you know, on a, you know, a bit of a side, but which one of those two do you, do you prefer? Or do you just love them both in different ways? I think so. I think, I like to think of them, I guess, as being two different forms of truth yeah. at the same time, right? Yeah. I think probably if I had to pick, I grew up more with the later recording. Sure. So that maybe just because of familiarity, that's a little bit more in my ear. Maybe yeah. When I, when I imagine the music, I, I imagine it that way somewhat more than the earlier, the 55. Yeah, you know, it's 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 actually kind of nice that you bring that up because I'll probably yeah. listen to those uh, again because I haven't heard them in years. Yeah. yeah. But um, I I just seem to remember. For, for, I just remember the the first one he did. I guess when he was younger, I just remember listening to it. And there's some technical things in there that are like staggering. Like, right? Yeah, it's it's. Right. I just remember being like, this is unbelievable what's right. happening. Um, but I love them both, so I'm definitely yeah. going to listen to both of those things again. So. Um, so tell me a little bit about the, the music you're going to play. Uh, so you're sure. doing some Chopin, uh, a few waltzes, and right. uh, some, some lists. Well, I'll, I'll begin with a uh, one of the Schubert songs, uh, yeah. one of my favorites, it's Stenchen. Yes. So Liszt transcribed it for solo piano, since obviously I'm not going to sing it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you know, Liszt had a, a habit of doing that to a lot of different 
types of music and actually you could say what's interesting is that at that point in time you know schubert was not well known the, oh okay yeah that's right? true you know yeah. he had been sort true. of lost to history so yep. um you know not entirely but for the most part he wasn't really in the repertoire so list in a way was by transcribing some of these songs was bringing him back to light and i know that you know there were other composers doing that brahms edited actually a lot of schubert Okay. early publications, you know, music from the manuscript for their first publication. So the two people who famously didn't like each other so much less than uh, Brahms <laughs> yeah. actually shared a mutual affinity for Schubert. That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never knew that. I never knew that about the, the edition. So he, he, was, he was literally just sort of the editor for some piano works? Right. It, or I think something? for some of the, what is it, Breitkopf and Hertel, some of the early publications of, say, the Lendler, for example, were yeah. actually published by Brahms. Wow. Interesting. This is, this, this, edited this, by Brahms. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Edit, yeah. No, that's, that's, um, that's actually, so that's one of the fun things about doing this, that I end up learning a lot of yeah, me too. <laughs> facts, <laughs> like, tidbits of information. So that's, that's awesome. And that, that's actually one of my, uh, one of my favorite songs yeah, as well, exactly. and one of my favorite transcriptions of lists. Right. So I'm, I'm really, really glad that you're playing that. It's really beautiful, especially how he, List has a, a knack for being incredibly faithful to the original material, but also very intelligent about how he he orchestrates it in a way right. on the piano. It's right. really, really cool. Yeah, and you and get a little bit of the three-handed effect at the end. You yeah. Know. Yeah, right. yeah, so yeah. That's one of List's favorite devices. It's, he really does it well in that transcription. It's really beautiful, so I'm glad you're playing it. Yeah. And so then you, you're doing a few waltzes. Right, then I'm going to do a set of three waltzes. Okay. Um, so the first one really needs no introduction, the minute waltz. I <laughs> um, and that'll be the first, and then I'll play uh, somewhat less known is the Vols Oublié by Liszt, which yes. is a late composition. Um, and third, I'll play um, a waltz from a jazz suite by Erwin Scholhoff, which was written okay. in like the late 1920s. Yeah. So, Roughly speaking, we have a you know representation of a waltz from every forty years. Yeah, so that's that you were telling me that's actually pretty cool. You could sort of see the development. Yeah. In, in language, and so tell me a little bit about Schulhoff because I, I actually don't know so much about him myself. Sure. Uh, yeah, like what's well, what's I'm his story? I I don't know a lot about him either. But you know, just learning a bit about him in the process of, of learning the set, which I've just started. Yeah. You know, really, just started learning. Um, he was Czech born. Okay. Um, grew up in Prague and actually met Dvorak as a child, where he was a very precocious pianist yeah. and received a lot of encouragement from Dvorak. And then went on to study with Debussy and Max Rager. So okay. incredible nice. compositional pedigree. Uh, very mm -hmm. interesting sort of musical mind. Um, would recommend reading you know, some of his letters and some of his writing about music. I think he really believed in the sort of combining music and politics, <laughs> So believe it or not, if you look at his list of works, he set the Communist Manifesto to music. So, <laughs> so a very interesting composer with a lot of different styles, I would say. Yeah. Um, almost no two works by Scholhoff are alike stylistically. He yeah. dabbled in a lot of different um, sort of areas of music, and in this particular piece that I'll play mostly in American jazz, which was becoming very popular That's at right. the time, but later yeah. he was um, embracing neoclassicism, embracing Dadaism, and other sort of musical trends that were um, prevailing at the time. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, eventually his, you know, his uh, political views caught up with him, and he ended up, unfortunately, dying in a concentration camp in oh. 1942. Wow. Um, so, you yeah, know, one of these composers who had so much to say, I think, and, yeah. you know, his life obviously was cut short, but, yeah. you know, That's just terrible. somebody who deserves a lot more recognition than he has. Um, yeah. Do you, do you know about when this suite or this waltz was composed? I think this was written a little earlier in his life, in the okay. 20, late 20s or early 30s. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's that's sort of about when that sort of kind of quote unquote American sound was yeah. kind of uh, sort of taking the world by storm. Right. And it's, it's really funny because if you look at a lot of compositions from around that time uh -huh. by random composers, it can sure. be anybody, you can, kind of, you can kind of almost see that all of them at the same time were experiencing this new sound mm -hmm. 
uh, all at once, and they're just like, whoa, I've got to try to figure out some way to, to do, yeah, yeah to, to experiment with this, just because yeah. it was it was so different and so and cool. Anecdotally, apparently, um, Scholhoff loved to dance. That yeah. he used to go out to dance clubs. Yeah. All night long, and would dance. So throughout Prague, all of these different sort of <laughs> musical groups would be coming through and performing, and you know he would hear them. So I think it, you know his ears were filled with a lot of a lot of that different sound. types of sounds. That's, I think you might hear just a little bit of that sort of early Hollywood kind of writing, like yeah, um, like corn bowl or something yeah. like that. A little yeah. bit of that harmonic language too. That's cool. That's really really young. I'm looking forward to hearing it because this is a, a new piece uh, for me yeah. to hear as well. So that'll be really nice. And uh, and then you're you're ending with the the fourth sure, ballad of right? yeah, for, which is one of my favorite pieces ever. No maybe. argument. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, like that's uh, it's a it's a tremendous piece. So tell tell me a little bit about your relationship with that. How did you? What's um, you know what's this? Did you learn it recently or a long time ago? And what's yeah, I'm trying to think. I think I actually did work on it at some point when I was in high school. It's one of those pieces that you know I love, of course. Yeah, as music. Um, really has a kind of rarefied era about it. It's almost like indescribable, right? Yeah. Um, I, I dabbled in it or I worked on it, but never really prepared it to perform. And then about a year ago, I, I worked on it more seriously and performed yeah. it a few times. So yeah. I put it away for a while, and now it's just beginning to come back to it a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's such, a, such a beautiful piece. I think yeah. it's, you know, it's one of those pieces of Chopin, because I mean, when you're talking about Chopin, like you said, you're already in a pretty high echelon of right. craftsmanship. Yeah. But then, even within that, it's like he, like he goes above the bar that right. that, that he said. But harmonically, structurally, he's doing like from a compositional standpoint some really pretty amazing things. It's yeah, a, that's true. Yeah. it's a it's a piece that I. Uh, I frequently refer to in composition classes and theory classes. Like, it's, oh, yeah. like I'm always taking excerpts from it. Yeah. Like, look at this, do this. <laughs> like, this is how yeah. it's done. You know. Well, I think he was really becoming immersed in Bach around that time. Interesting. So I understand. So you know, you have these kind of uh, contrapuntal. Yes. Yes. Right. Yes. Passages that are, you know, Chopin can be contrapuntal, but sort of to a much greater degree. Right? Yes. Um, I agree. Also, the way he's sort of combining these dance elements, sort of subtle allusions to different dances throughout, and merging them with, with you know, the counterpoint. It's just it's unbelievable. Incredible. It's actually funny you bring up the rhythm because that's that's the reason that I refer to that piece so much in classes uh -huh. is because he's using these really clever iso rhythms, yes, like where yeah. he, it's, it's just like this sort of unending, mm -hmm. very simple rhythmic pattern. But he disguises it with you know lots of counterpoint, lots of uh, you know chromaticism, beautiful right. harmony. But when you look at it in its most basic sense, it's like it's these dances really that right. he's layered yeah. uh, this incredible tapestry over. It's really right. really cool. So I know you guys will enjoy that. Yeah, and then uh, the end, I, of course, is very oceanic. I would describe it. Oh it's yeah, this huge surge of emotion. And it is. You know, I, I always ask people like, what's because it's a piece that's been. Uh, you know, played and recorded a lot. Right. Like, what sort of a recording of that piece that you admire a lot? Because it's one of those pieces that it's been yeah. recorded through the entire age of recording technology. Well, but I have a few that I really love. Oh, yeah, no, I'm curious to hear. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very hard to say. I think it really depends on my mood, probably. Um, yeah. There's a recording by Ignaz Tigerman. Do you know this pianist? No. A, a student of Ignaz Friedman, who's like one of my. Yeah, I He's a great pianist. Yeah. yeah. Um, and. He lived a lot of his career in Egypt, in Cairo, because he had really bad asthma. And oh. it was thought at the time that he lived in, in a climate like that would be better for him. Um, yeah. So he lived most of his life there. He taught, um, he, he performed as well. And there's a really provincial recording of him, which was apparently recorded on an old upright by one of his students with, you know, like a, some sort of handheld recording device in the 1950s. Okay. But hey, look it up on YouTube. Um, I will. And it just, Extraordinarily beautiful, very um, special performance, I think. Yeah, um, that's, I'm, I'm definitely going to have to listen to yeah. that. Yeah, and I always think of Hoffman. There's a famous Hoffman yeah. recording, which is just that's That's, the, that's probably but, the one. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's live, right? Yes. I believe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's live. Yeah, yeah that, that recording is kind of, that's one of my favorites to listen to, just from a pianistic perspective. Like, some of the things right. that he does are like, it's, it's borderline inhuman. It's really, right. really amazing. Yeah, very original. 
that's one of very them. much so very much so yeah awesome so let's uh sure. let's listen to it it's gonna okay. be it's gonna be awesome thanks so much for coming thank you and so much for yeah having me. yeah it's a pleasure it's a pleasure so let's uh i'm gonna get this stuff out of your way okay and now we I'll can begin with the, with the sugar okay and then it'll be the three waltzes and then the sugar. awesome yeah and for you guys watching uh i put the program down in the in the description so you guys can follow along and see what he's playing all right let's uh all let's right. do it enjoy yeah
right. That was awesome, man. That thank was you. really, really great. Really, really great. I, I really enjoyed everything you did. It was thank you. really well, thank awesome. Thank you for having me. It's yeah. wonderful that you're doing this. And, yeah, it's uh, been a lot of fun. Yeah. It's been a lot of fun just to, to see old faces and play again and, and hear some music. So I'm, you know, I'm really glad you could be, you could be a part Thanks of this. Thanks for having me. It's you great know, to uh, flex the performance muscle too. Because yeah. It's been a while, yes. Yeah, you know, it, it definitely, um, it, it feels strange to play again, you know, and for, I know for an audience. Mean, yes. And so it's like, mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to just have that feeling again. You know, right. it, even just doing a live stream, it still feels real still in a way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it feels, it feels kind of nice. So, um, you know, thank you guys for watching. You know, always, you know, just comment, like it. Uh, let us know where you're listening from. That's always a huge help. Also, uh, feel free to donate uh, to Matthew. Uh, there's a, a link right there for, for Venmo. So please feel free to support him if you love what you've heard. I certainly have. Uh, and also, uh, uh, next week, uh, same time, we're going to have another stream. Uh, the trio is coming back. We're going to do some new music. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, we're also starting a Patreon for the live stream. So you, if you guys are interested in just supporting the live stream, uh, supporting concerts like this. Uh, you can just go to Patreon. You can look for Jeremy Johnny Jordan. I'm right there. I'll have more information about that for you guys probably next week. Uh, but thank you for, for listening. Thank you for checking us out. A huge thank you to Mr. Grable. And, uh, thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. yeah, it's been a lot of fun. We'll see you guys soon. Take, Take care. care. Yep. Bye.